So the title of this morning's message comes out of a scripture in Revelation 21.5. You can put the whole scripture up there, but the main thing of this scripture that I titled it was, Behold, I make all things new. And he, this Revelation 21.5, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Behold, amen, he makes all things new. I want you to know that before we even start reading the passage out of Isaiah 61, we're going to read verses 1 through 3, that no matter what you're going through this morning, you might feel like you're getting old, you might feel like you're wor feeling worn out, like your life is worn out, but I'm here to tell you this morning, spiritually speaking, God says, behold, I make all things new. Amen. 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 Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Why? That he might be glorified. Yes, yes. Father, we just thank you this morning, Lord, for the opportunity yes. to share your word. Oh, Lord, I pray, Lord God, that you would use me simply as a vessel through which you would flow. Lord God, the word of God teaches that you have chosen the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise. Lord, you've chosen fallen man to be a mouthpiece for you and your perfect word. Lord God, I pray that your word would flow. Lord God, this morning, I pray that you, the preacher, you, the teacher, Lord, would be here and that you, oh Lord God, would speak your word to your people, Lord God. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I put up here this little timeline. I know I do this a lot, but sometimes I try to get in some. We, we don't have Sunday school, so to try to like put it in our Sunday morning teaching sometimes, I think it's important, you know, in my, when I look at the, the Bible in, in general, I look at it, I start a lot of times from the fall. The creation of God is extremely important. We've taught that every time we've gone through Genesis. And in the end, what I, what I have come to realize is that there's no doubt in my mind that God had such perfect order in creation, but that ultimately his whole point was to create an environment that was habitable for mankind to live upon. And I believe with all of my heart that it was always God's plan that he was going to create man. And I don't mean to get too ahead of myself, but I believe that the enemy of our soul knew that. I believe it with all of my heart knew that the plan of God ultimately was to create man in some way, shape or form. What he understood before man was ever created, what he understood before the earth was ever in the place where it is now where God created it, whether you want to say that he, Genesis 1, 1, in between that and Genesis, Genesis 1, 2, some people talk about the prophet Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah talking about tohu, bohu, I'm not trying to get too complicated on you, but that the earth had already been formed and now it was without, now it was void and without form, meaning in chaos and, and God not, doesn't create anything that way. And that the reality is this, is that God had already formed the earth and the fall of Satan caused a cataclysmic change and that everything was dead. Everything had, was, was just because that's what sin does. But that God spoke, the Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the deep. God the Father spoke and had a plan. Amen. And whenever, whenever he spoke the word, the living word of God, the Bible teaches that Jesus was the word, the pre-incarnate word. Amen. That he was by the Father's side at the day that creation took place. And I believe it's still the same. The Father had a plan. The word spoke the plan. And the Holy Spirit hovered over the deep and creation took place. Amen. And he was so methodical about the way he created Amen. He had, a, he had sun and water before he ever had plant life because the scientist teaches that thing called photosynthesis and you can't have one without the other. Right. He had all of that in place, the animal life and plant life before he ever created man. But the point is, is that it was always his plan to create mankind. He had a big old plan to create a creation that had a free will. Yeah. 
that would willingly choose him. Not choose their own way, but choose him and choose his way to have a relationship with him. I've said it many times before. God is not interested in a relationship with robots. He wants to have a relationship with people who have a desire to love him, to reciprocate love to him. He's proven his love to mankind and that he gave us his son, Jesus. And that's why I typically start with the fall, that mankind finds itself in a place through the fall where sin is rampant upon the earth. And it becomes so bad that then the flood has to take place. God purged the earth. You know, he purged the earth and he started anew. Eight people made it into the new world. Eight is the, is the eighth day. Eight, the eighth day is how they talk about that. It would also be the day after the Sabbath, after the final. Eight describes a new beginning. Eight people made it into the new world. And it was a new beginning for the world. And it's similar in our salvation. Whenever we are found dead in sin in our first birth of Adam and the gospel comes and tells us the good news. And by faith, we believe in the gospel plan of Jesus Christ. And we put our faith in that. The old man dies. He's buried and a new man is resurrected and he receives newness of life. Amen. And then after the flood, we know of the story of the Tower of Babel. I could speak a lot on that, but I, for the sake of time, I'm not. But if you flip the script, one thing I will flip the page, I mean, one thing I will say is this. What I see in the Tower of Babel is, is that mankind had come together and rebelled, but God forced them to spread over the face of the earth because it was always his plan. When we see in the book of Revelation... It talks about the fact that you have delivered us. You deserve glory and honor because you have delivered us from every tongue, tribe, and nation. It was always God's plan that mankind would inhabit the earth and that people groups from every tongue, tribe, and nation would be saved. Amen. And, and, and so we see that God forced mankind to spread over the globe. And within their, their languages, they separated into different, different people groups. But the point that I want to make, and I said it, I've said it many times, is when you turn the page from chapter 11 of Genesis where it talks about the Tower of Babel to chapter 12, we realize at that point in time, or at least I have realized by the grace of God, that there was no nation for God. There was a bunch of Gentile nations, a bunch of heathen nations. There were individual people on the earth that knew God, but there was no nation that belonged to God. And so out of one of those heathen nations, God called a man named Abraham out and he said, I will make a great nation out of you. Amen. And that's where we see the calling of Abraham. Really and truly, I should have put some dates up there just to give you an idea. We can only speculate these time frames, but we know that for Abraham, it was about 2000 B.C. For the Exodus, it was somewhere around 1450 B.C. And then somewhere from here, about 1400 all the way to the kings, which is about 1000 B.C. And then Solomon, you know, he was the third king in the line of, of Israel. And the reason I just jumped straight to Solomon and I skipped Saul and David is because that's I'm trying to get us to where we are this morning in Isaiah chapter six, which I'm about to read to you in a moment. I'm sorry, where we read in Isaiah chapter 61. Uh Solomon, we know the story, and many of us at least that have studied the Bible understand that Solomon sinned against the Lord and that he had made altars for, he married many wives that were not of the nation of Israel, God's people. Whenever we talk a lot about, many times I'll always transition into, you know, the Bible teaching that we should not be unequally yoked with unbelievers and that it's so important that we don't connect ourselves to the world in a close relationship or fellowship type. Listen, there can be problems even in business. Now, if you're an employee, you're going to have to make the determination. You know, I'm not trying to say that you can't work for a heathen. But what I'm trying to say is that that heathen is causing you to change your stance and, to, and, to, and, and your morality and making you make choices that are against God and God's word. And you have a problem. But even in business decisions, being unequally yoked with unbelievers can cause a problem. I'm not saying that it always will, but it can because many times unbelievers can. Well, unfortunately, sometimes believers can also be unethical. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that in any type of a close relationship, I'm talking about fellowship. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about just just an acquaintance. See, we have acquaintances with the world. Yeah. The Bible teaches us to be separate. He does, it doesn't teach us to isolate. It teaches us to separate. 
And the, the word of God was clear in the Old Testament, but that scripture I quoted to you, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers, is in the New Testament. And God told his people Israel, do not marry their wives and don't allow your sons to marry their daughters. Because if you do, they will draw your heart far from me. Because the truth of the matter is that the world in their darkness do not understand the God that you serve. Have you ever tried to talk to a person that's completely an unbeliever about the things of God? I don't know about you, but I sure have. And if they're not interested, I mean, I'm just saying they might be interested in a friendship with you. But if they're not interested in the, in the things of God, then it's completely like a, a wall that stands between they, they don't understand and they don't really want to understand. And if you think that you're going to transform their way of thinking, no. What's going to happen is, is that their way of thinking is going to begin to transform you if you continue to allow yourself to be close to that situation. Their darkness will begin to creep in. The darkness of the world will begin to creep in. Listen to me. The darkness of the world is trying to creep into the church. That's another story for another time. But Solomon allowed that darkness to creep into his life. He married many a wives. He married women from Egypt, women from Ammon, women from all over the place, Moab. And these women worshiped false gods. They did not know the God of Solomon. And Solomon did not influence their lives because the Bible teaches us they influenced his life. He was the wisest man that ever lived on the earth. The Bible attributes to him. And what he did was he built altars for them. He built altars for the God of Ammon. He built altars for the God of Moab. And the Bible teaches, I'm just using those two as an example. He built altars for other ones. They required child sacrifice. Chemosh and Molech. They required child sacrifice, which was a horrendous thing in the eyes of God. And because of Solomon's decision, it caused division in the kingdom of God. I can tell you that when we make decisions... In our own lives that are not according to the will of God, we allow darkness in, we open up a door, we give Satan a foothold. It will cause division in our life. It will cause chaos. It will cause turmoil. No matter how small or how big it is, it will result in not harmony and peace, but instead chaos. That's why I kind of drew there because that was the result of Solomon's failure against God was that the, the kingdom was split in two and that we ended up with the northern kingdom Israel and the southern kingdom Judah and then after that we have this long line of all these different kings and through the kings what we learn is is that it seems as though every now and then we'd have a king that really loved the Lord but for the most part the next king was worse than the king that was prior to it and what happens is, is because of their disobedience around 721 B.C., Israel is brought under captivity to the kingdom of Assyria. The Assyrians brought the northern kingdom, Israel, under captivity. And about 586 B.C., the Babylonians brought the southern kingdom, Judah, under captivity. What does that have to do? Well, it has a lot to do with the history of Israel. But in addition to that, the same kind of thing can happen in your life as a believer. And what I mean by that is, is that when you open up the door to sin the way that Israel opened up the door to sin in their own lives, it allows the enemy, it gives him permission to have power over your life. Jesus died and paid a high price for you and I to be able to have victory in our lives. But when we open up doors and we allow the enemy to come in and put, give a foothold to the devil, it allows him to have power in our lives. It allows chaos to begin to take place. And sometimes we wonder how we ever ended up where it is that we are. And the reality is, is that if we'll just back up a little bit and be honest with ourselves, we can see many times where we actually were the ones that opened up the door. The prophet Isaiah was about 740 B.C. And so he's actually prophesying before this ever takes place, before this ever takes place. But he's warning the children of Israel. T times are already bad. Times are already bad. They've had kings like Ahab already who married Jezebel, who caused false prophets of Baal to, 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 to be hired and to sit at the table with them and, and to lead the people astray in idol worship. And times are going to get even worse after the prophet Isaiah. 
Times are going to get worse because there's another king later named Manasseh that was worse than the ones before him. And so what I'm trying to say, though, is this. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of a context of where we are in the Bible this morning with Isaiah the prophet and the fact that he actually prophesied in the southern kingdom, Judah, and, and the area mostly in Jerusalem, prophesying and warning the people of God about the things that were coming, but also in addition to telling them that because of the choices that they made, that there would be chaos and that there would be division and that there would be pain, there would also be restoration. Because God is a God of mercy, He's a God of grace, and He's a God of restoration, and He loves His people. Amen? Amen. The call of Isaiah comes out of Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. I just wanted to kind of share that with you a little bit. But we're going to focus on the passage that I read. We're going to preach that. But this is when God called Isaiah. It was during the year that King Uzziah died. It's probably one of my favorite Old Testament passages. It describes so much in the heavenly realm that we can see the way that things are in heaven. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died... I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne. I didn't want to preach this passage of scripture this morning, but I will say I can't help myself. The word Isaiah means strength. And many times in our own lives, we need our own strength to be moved out of the way before we'll be willing or really capable of truly seeing the Lord for the way that he really is. Because many times what we're doing is we're trying in our own strength, our own wisdom, to figure things out and to, and to, and to you know, to sometimes manipulate circumstances and, and in our own strength to, to cause what we might think even as God's will to, to come to pass. But whenever our strength dies, you know, the Apostle Paul even said that in one of the, his letters to the Corinthians. He said, he said he asked the Lord three times to remove this thorn that was in his flesh because it was a great hindrance and a burden in his life. But the Lord's response was, my grace is sufficient for you, for in weakness, my strength is made perfect. You and I need to get a revelation of that. Amen. That in the midst of our weakness, if we'll move out of the way, God's strength can be perfected in our lives. God's strength can show up and do a work in our lives that we cannot do. Amen. Many times, though, I have to tell you that there's going to have to be, not all the time, I may be, I, you know, not all the time. Not everybody's going to face the same amount of chaos, even as believers. I'm talking to believers this morning. But many times, God has to allow some chaos in our lives to get us to the point where we're convinced that we don't want to fix it. But that in reality, what we do want is God's will to be in our lives. So the strength of Israel has died, their king. And he saw the Lord seated upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple above it. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You know, we get a picture. I don't know about you, but I see a picture of the holy of holies on the earth that we have. Beyond the veil, the, the ark of the covenant. The mercy seat, two angels facing one another. And in the heavenlies, we see the glory of God, the temple of God. And we see these two angels facing one another and they're speaking back to one another. And they're crying out that God is holy and that the old, whole earth is full of his glory. The power of this caused the post of the door to be moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I don't know about you, but I know God's an awesome God. Amen. When there's been times like whenever, have you ever really got into the presence of the Lord? Yes. Where you worship the Lord? You know, some people can go so long in their Christian journey and never really enter into the presence of God. It's a, it, it really is. It's a sad thing. And those of you that have truly made contact with the palpable presence of God in your personal worship time or even maybe in a corporate service, you know what I'm talking about. 
Because you've been touched by God in that moment and in that situation. Right, right. But there's a lot like I went 12 years without really making that deep connection to the Lord. I'm talking about. But whenever I found myself in a place of brokenness and chaos and, and, and hurt in my life. Amen. The Lord, I, as I sought the face of God, I was able to make I was able to connect to him I, in my in my brokenness and my humility. The Lord showed up and he spoke to me. And one of the things that that happened to me is kind of like what Isaiah is saying. I realized how unworthy I was. Now, I got to tell you, it's not the way that I would have described it to you. Like if I said it, I would sound harsh because I know that this, I come across that way sometimes. I don't really know how to describe it other than in that moment when I felt the closest connection to God that I've ever felt. I felt passing in front of my eyes almost like a video of my life and all the failures happening so fast. It's like only something that God could do. It's like he was sparking all these memories and it was like flooding through like a fast film and it was going through my heart and in my mind. But at the same time, God was healing the whole time. He was healing and he was touching and he was making whole. See, the enemy would cause condemnation in our lives. The Holy Spirit at that moment in time, he was showing me how much I had failed. But at the same time, he was showing me that he was a God of restoration, a God of resurrection, and that he was going to make all things new. Amen. And this is what Isaiah saw. He said, I, woe is me for I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. The nation of Israel was unclean when Isaiah began to prophesy. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphims, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. He laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. You know, it's a beautiful picture right here, because if you know anything about the temple, then you know that there was an altar of sacrifice upon which the fire had to burn continually. And from that altar, they would take a tongs and take coals and they would bring it into the holy place and they would put that coal on the altar of incense. And from there, they would allow they would burn the incense off of that coal. But what I want you to see right here is this is a picture of the cross. This is a picture of the sacrifice of Jesus because the coal that was burning had to have come from the altar of sacrifice. Right. The altar of sacrifice is a type of, of, of the sacrifice of Jesus. And it's that and that alone that cleanses from unrighteousness mm -hmm. and iniquity. I wanted to just say all of this and prepare all of this to show you where we were in the time frame of when, where Israel was, the calling of Isaiah, to see the desperation of the people and how they, where they were, what, what their choices had brought them into. And now I want to go back to the first passage that we that we spoke of. It was out of Isaiah 61. My first point, my actually my first two or three points come out of verse one. My point, point number one is this. He heals broken hearts. Amen? Amen. Verse one, a portion of it says this. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart. And it's also important that I let you know that this same passage of scripture out of Isaiah 61 was spoken by Jesus in Luke chapter 4. Right, right. The Bible teaches that he showed up to the synagogue and as his custom was, he, 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 would, he showed up to the synagogue and when he did, they would take turns reading and the person who was in charge uh, that handed him a scroll and the scroll that they handed him to read, when he opened it up, it was this passage right here. Isaiah chapter 61 where it says that the Lord had anointed him and that the Lord had sent him to bind up the brokenhearted. That's my first point. Jesus comes to heal broken hearts. The, the father had sent him to bind up the brokenhearted. I got to tell you that the word bind in this context, it describes something that's wrapped. A bandage holding broken pieces in place, providing an environment of healing. Brokenhearted here is something that is crushed or torn. Great pain and sorrow is being described. Sometimes this word was used to describe a woman in the midst of childbirth. You know, sometimes life has a way of leaving us in this condition, right? Like the story of the Good Samaritan out of Luke chapter 10. There are times in our lives when we find ourselves 
broken and crushed and tattered and torn, left on the side of the road, hopeless, helpless, and uncertain how this situation is ever going to improve. And then, praise God, a good Samaritan shows up. Yeah. In the story that I'm talking about, the Good Samaritan describes a situation where thieves leave a man on the side of the road, beaten and bleeding and left to die. And all the people in the story that we would have expected that would have stopped to help this poor man who was bleeding and dying. No, they don't stop. They just look at him and they cross over to the other side of the road and they just keep on going. The story tells that he's. That, but thank God there was a good Samaritan. Amen. Yeah. And the story tells us that he stopped and he ministered to the needs of this hurting and this bleeding and dying man. And I don't know about you, but there have been times and sometimes still are in my life that I feel like this man on the side of the road. My heart is torn. I turn corners and I'm looking for answers every time I turn a corner. But the truth is, is repeatedly there seems to be no help because I'm not looking towards the right direction. And then, praise God, the Good Samaritan shows up. Jesus shows up in the midst of my life. Yes. Amen. And there he is. Just like he promised. Yeah. He promised he would never leave me or forsake me. Yeah. Amen. And he said the same for you. And while I was busy trying to find another way to heal, he was busy pouring in the oil and the yeah. wine. Amen. Amen. The kind that restores the soul. You know, the wine is the blood that flowed from Emmanuel's veins. The Bible teaches that whenever the shedding of blood, the purpose of the shedding of blood was because the life of the creature in this physical world is in the blood. And so when we talk about the blood, we're really talking about the sacrificial death of an innocent uh, sacrifice, paying the price for the guilty. And that, oil, that wine that was poured in represents, because also the wine really in the physical at that time was used to cleanse a wound. And the, 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 the wine or the blood of Jesus cleanses us from the wounds of sin. Amen. And, not, and listen, because of the wine and the faith in Christ is what I'm trying to say. There's a free flow of the Holy Spirit, which is the oil. He poured in the oil and the wine, the kind that restores the soul. I might have been looking around every corner looking for some kind of an answer for my torn heart. And in the pain that I was, that I was in, looking for something to satisfy a, the emptiness on the inside of me. But it only left me more empty. But praise God when the good Samaritan shows up. Up, and he pours in the oil and the wine when I will take my faith and I will come to the place where I realize nothing else is going to help me, Lord. Yes. Everything else is just going to leave me empty. Everything else is yes. going to leave me in pain. But if I look to you and your finished work, the oil of the Holy Spirit flows in. Amen. Amen. And it brings healing. Yes. I'm here to tell you, God heals broken hearts. He will restore. Amen. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know why. Maybe your heart might be broken. But I'm here to tell you that if you'll look to the Good Samaritan, his name is Jesus. Yes. If you'll put your faith in, in his work and what he did, the oil of the Spirit can flow into your heart. Amen. You might be broken, but you need to know if you will let him, he holds the bandage. Yes, he does. He holds the bandage that we need to heal our hearts. That was point number one. He heals broken hearts. Point number two. We're moving fast. He opens prison doors. That's right. Verse one. To proclaim liberty to the captives. And the opening of the prison. To them that are bound. Yes. I wrote in my notes. Asking the question. Have you ever been bound by sin? Then I started thinking maybe the more appropriate question would to ask, have you ever been delivered from the bondage of sin? Yeah. And the reason why I say that is because if you've never been delivered, it's likely that you may have never realized that you were even bound. Right. <laughs> Possibly thinking that bondage was a normal way of life. Yeah. Being bondage to sin results in a state of hopelessness. A life filled with desperate decisions that heap a greater weight already upon already existent burdens resulting in a walk where every step is heavier and forks to another trail of nowhere. Mm. Whenever you're feeling hopeless, you start reaching and grasping and looking for something 
But the reality of it is, I'm going back to what I've already said, and I said it almost every time that I preach. We have a tendency, even as the people of God, to take matters into our own hands, to try to remedy our own situation, thinking that the decisions that we're going to make are going to fix the problem. And the reality of it is, is that what we do is we just take another detour, another turn into a direction, a fork in the road, a fork in the trail that leads to another trail of nowhere. In the physical, Paul and Silas were bound in a prison for preaching the gospel in Acts 16. Acts 16 explains their hopeless situation where their backs had been beaten bloody and their feet were fastened tight in prison stocks. If you've ever read the story, you know what I'm talking about. I don't really know what it looked like, but I'm sure it was quite the mess. The Bible says that they were on the inside of the prison. What it's talking about is it's talking about a dark and a dank dungeon. You know, those dungeons there were very, very humid, moist, probably cold. That's why Paul, in the last time he was in prison, in the book to, to Timothy at the end, 2 Timothy, he says, he says to bring the cloak and to bring the, paper, the writings. It was very dark and it was cold. And, 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 and I, I can only imagine their, their backs were beaten. And it's not bad enough that they're in the, the inside of this dark, cold prison. Their backs are beaten. I, I don't know how bad their backs are beaten, but they're, they're beaten pretty bad back in those days whenever they would beat them. I would imagine it's kind of hard to breathe even, you know? I would think. I've never been beaten by a whip, thank God. But I would imagine that when you've been beaten by a whip and the skin on your back is torn, that it's not that easy to take a deep breath and in addition to that, what more misery could you have? Now you're going to put my feet in some stocks of wood to where I can't get up and walk and stretch. And somehow in the middle of all that, they thought it was a good idea to start praising the Lord. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I could just only imagine my own self how miserable I would be. I guess whenever you find yourself and you've known the Lord and you've seen God deliver you out of some situations and you really find yourself in the middle of a hopeless circumstance and you have no way to fix your situation, that what's left is, I can't do anything else. I really need to go ahead and praise the Lord. Amen? And that's what they do. They go ahead and they start praising the Lord. And a miracle happens. Yeah. Hallelujah. The earth began to quake. And not only that, the stocks came unloose some kind of way. And the, the prison door flung open. Hallelujah. And the Lord gave them freedom in their life. Now listen, now a whole lot more goes on in that story. But what I want you to know is this. One minute they were in bondage and captivity. And the next minute they were set free. Praise God. That's how fast God can do a suddenly in our lives. God can show up when we least expect it. And he can do the most wonderful of things in our lives. If we'll just trust him. Praise God that even whenever it's bad in our lives to just trust him. The story of Lazarus. I thought about that because we're talking about binding. We're talking about being bound. We're talking about being set free from captivity. We're talking about prison doors being open. And in the story of Lazarus, he was dead for four days. He was bound up in garments of death, wrapped up like a mummy. But Jesus told him to come forth, come out of that grave of death, Lazarus, walk towards me and watch me do a miracle in your life. You know, it doesn't matter what others might think. Wherever you are in your life, you may think that people are against you. But if you're hearing from the voice of God and you're convinced you're hearing from the voice of God, and he's telling you to walk towards him and to trust him. Get up and walk towards him and trust him. And there he stands. Lazarus standing there, but he's still bound in grave clothes. Those garments of death that serve to restrict him and prevent him from going and doing what God has planned for his life. But Jesus says, no. See, Jesus has the last say. So he says, loose him and set him free. Death and sin has no power upon him because the word of the Lord has the last say. So the words of Jesus have power over sin and death. Praise God. Yeah. They loose Lazarus, man, I just, I remember I've preached this so many times. He, he, he was bound, he couldn't see. His face was bound, his body was bound. I don't know if he came hopping out of there like that. He couldn't even see which direction he was going in. That's what sin will do to you though. Yeah. Sin will blind you. It will blind your spiritual eyes. You find yourself going in a direction you never intended to go and you don't know how you're going to get back and it will cripple you. It will restrict you to the point where you can't use your arms the way you're supposed to. You can't use your feet. You can't get to going where the Lord had intended intended for you. You right. find yourself sidelined and sidetracked. Right. But praise God the words of the Master. Hallelujah. 
He has the last say so. Amen. Right. Praise God. That was point number one was he heals broken hearted. He heals the broken hearted. Point number two is he opens prison doors. We're moving fast this morning. This is point number three. He will add some hope and color to your life. He's going to add some hope and color to your life. This comes out of verse 3. To give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. This may be a bad illustration, but I can remember as a young boy, my mama had this collection of eight track tapes. Y'all even know what that is? <laughs> you know, some of y'all are so young, y'all like, what was eight track tape? They probably get a pretty penny for them things nowadays. She had a collection of eight track tapes. She had all kinds of stuff, but I remember this one, one that she played a lot. It was Freddie Fender, and he had this song in there. And in the song, the the, the word said this: "There's nothing cold as ashes after the fire is gone." See, the Lord said right here that He would give them beauty for ashes. What Freddie Fender was talking about is, is that after the love that he had experienced with this person was gone, that there was nothing left, and it was just cold. There's nothing as cold as the ashes after the fire is gone. That's what he's talking about. But, you know, there's a truth to that in the sense that ashes are all burned up. There's nothing left. You understand what I'm getting at? The Israel was in a state in their spirituality where sin had ravaged them and stolen so much from their lives that there was nothing left. You can apply a spark to an ash all day long. You can spark and spark and spark, but there's no energy contained anymore inside of an ash. There's no hope on the inside of that ash. That thing is dead and it will not come to life. It will not spark up. It will not ever turn into another flame. But the Lord says, I will give you beauty for ashes. Yeah. Praise God. God promised to exchange beauty for ashes. He will exchange out a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness. The terminology of a spirit of heaviness is described in the original language as gray and dark. Whereas the garment of praise is colorful and full of life. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in a world that's full of gray and dark. I don't want to be like some person that's stuck in a black and white movie. <laughs> you know, what, what I mean is, it's just, if you ever watch a black and white movie, it just seems so dull sometimes. It's hard for me to watch them. I mean, there's been some good ones. But the, but the point is, is that it's so much better. I mean, whenever they, when it, look, I don't, whatever, The Wizard of Oz, I know that they switch from black, black and white into Technicolor. You know, and the world seems a whole lot better when there's some color connected to it. When I think of a gray and a dark sky, I think of stormy. Uh, do you ever feel that way whenever there's stormy clouds out there? That is just it, just, it seems to be a little bit more depressing on the outside. Maybe sometimes we feel like we're stuck in a black and white movie. Everything is somber and sad, but God wants to add some color. Amen. He wants to give you a spirit of praise. He wants his spirit of color and life to mix with your spirit that might be darkened down. I'll put this in here. Don't get mad at me because he's speaking it to me too. He wants to turn us from a powder to a praiser. Amen. You know, Paul and Silas could have been stuck in them, stuck in them stocks with their back beaten, right? Pouting about the misery of the situation that they were. In. Come on, help me out. Help the preacher out. You know, we're over here doing the work of the Lord. And really all we did was tell we rebuked the spirit that was in that, that woman. We didn't even do it right, right away. We let her talk for a little while, but she was irritating and frustrating the will of God. You know, one of the things that we got to come to the realization of is this. Is that, you know, that woman actually was saying some truth. Right. She was saying some true things. She was saying, these men be of the Lord. They be, they are, they're being led by God. That was true, but she was interrupting the work of God. It was a demon spirit that was on the inside of her, and she was telling people's fortune. She was a necromancer. She was speaking from the dead to the dead and telling people about And so she was under the influence of demonic spirits, and they cast that devil out of her, and then she couldn't operate anymore. And so her owners got mad because they couldn't make any more money. They put Paul and Silas in prison. They beat them, and they put them in the stocks. But instead of them pouting about it, they began to praise the Lord. I think that that's a good word for us. Yeah, yes. That's a good word for me. 
find yourself in your little situation when you're feeling down on yourself instead of pouting, man, start praising. God will show up, amen. He'll show up in your life. Or, or you could, no, you don't have to do that. Because he gave you a free will. You don't have to do that. If you want to have a pity party, you can. If you want to continue to think, you know, that the way that you've been going is going to lead and guide you into the direction that you want to go, you can continue to stay there and you can continue to be down. Or you can say, you know what, Lord, this is where you have me. This is the season of my life. I'm going to praise you in spite of the surrounding circumstances. I'm going to trust you to show up in my life. Amen. I'm going to trust that you're going to put some color in here. I'm going to trust that you're going to give me beauty for ashes. It might seem like there's nothing left. Amen. But God, when he shows up, can, can bring life. Praise God. That brings me to my last point. Point number four. He waters his plants. In verse 3, it says right here that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. That's what I liked about in, the, in one of the songs that Naya was singing. It talked about she started talking about giving glory to the Lord. The word that Sabrina gave, it repeatedly talked about us giving glory to the Lord. And what God promised his people Israel, and I'm telling you, he will do it for us, right. is that he will water his plants. He will cause them to flourish. He will cause them to grow. And ultimately, the purpose of all of that is so that he would be glorified. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a reputation from your past? You don't have to raise your hand. Do you have a reputation from your past? What was your past? What do people know you as? People in the community will really probably never want to let you live down your past. But let me just say this. They can talk about you all day long. When the Lord changes you and waters you and causes you to flourish, and puts his spirit on the inside of you, they're going to be able to see something different about you. Yeah. They can talk about you, but you know what you do? You leave that up to the Lord. Right. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Right. You trust God in the middle of that situation, He will show up and He will take your defense. God is your defender. Mm -hmm. But that's what I want you to know. He is going to water His plants. He's going to take care of, of, the, of the planting that belongs to Him. Why? Because in the end, it's going to bring Him glory. God is all about bringing glory to himself. Why is God about bringing glory to himself? Is he just some, some uh, like arrogant, egotistical person up in heaven? A narcissist, that's a good word. A narcissist up in heaven looking to receive. I want all the glory for me. No, it's not the issue. He's the, he is the God of glory. He slung the stars in the sky. He breathed life into a lump of clay. He brings life out of death. And he wants to bring life into people's lives that are in the middle of death. But until he's glorified, nobody even knows about him. Because to glorify God means to sound an alarm. It means to, to make him known. It means to let the world know that there is a real God in heaven who changes people's lives. And when people see your life changed, it brings glory to God. Yes. Yes. We've talked a lot about the parable of the sower on Wednesdays lately. How the seed is the gospel planted in the heart, taking root and blossoming into a harvest that belongs to God. At the time that Isaiah speaks this prophecy to Israel, there have been really bad days. I've already mentioned this. Ahab, and there will be even more worse days. Manasseh, Babylonian captivity. But God will never completely give up on Israel. You know why? Because they're his people. God's not done with Israel. Don't let, if you hear a preacher on the radio or somewhere else, some Google, you Google something on YouTube and you're listening to a preacher. If they tell you that God's done with Israel and that now we're just spiritual Israel. God is not done with Israel. Amen. God, they are his people. And there's going to come a day when they're going to realize that they've been duped into a lie by the Antichrist. And they're going to be receptive of Jesus when he returns from the millennial reign of Christ. The Bible teaches in the book of Zechariah, they will look upon me whom they pierced and they will mourn for me as one who mourns for an only son. They will realize what they did and they will embrace Jesus. But even more than that, we're his New Testament bride. We are the plantings of the Lord. This is so much more true today, this story, now that we understand the parable of the sower. 
Even compared to when it was first spoken to Israel, the seed of the gospel has been planted in you and I. It has taken root in our hearts, and if we will let him, he will nurture the growth and development of this beautiful plant. Do you want to know how I know that he wants to do that? Because the scripture says that he receives glory from it. When he changes your life, he receives glory from it. See, when the one that was brokenhearted is bandaged and healed, God receives glory. When the one that was in a spiritual prison is released and freed, God receives glory. When the one that was moving around in the sorrow of a black and white movie puts on the new and colorful garment of praise, God receives glory. And when that plant is touched by the master's hand, God receives glory. Naya, would you mind coming up to the front? Because I'm going to close with this last scripture. And I just want to give people the opportunity. If you want prayer this morning, you can come up to the front. I'm not trying to coerce you. I, look, I just want you to know that we're going to have altar time. If nothing else, we're just going to worship the Lord. But I want to close with this last scripture right here. Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreads out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat comes, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful. In, in other words, the word careful right there means anxious or scared, fearful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. You know what it's saying is, is this, the planting of the Lord. He will plant us near rivers of living water. And that, when that root system goes deep, and taps into the rivers of living water of the Holy Spirit. You might find yourself in a season of drought. You might find yourself in a season of dry. But I'm here to tell you, you don't have to fear. Because the Lord will take care of you. Yes. Amen. And he will also continue to allow you by his grace and his strength to bear fruit for his name. To bring him.